Hi, I'm Old North Specialist Dr. Jackson Crawford, and all day I've been worried about thunder, or really about the lightning that thunder means. It seems to come out of nowhere, even when the sky is relatively blue or blue in one half of it like it is right now, and the lightning can strike frighteningly close even when uh, you haven't heard any before. You know, it seems to go from uh, 4,000 feet away to right next to you. Especially in a forest of tall trees like this, I get extra worried because even if the lightning doesn't hit me, it just hits to hit one of these tall pines and uh, maybe start a fire or uh, knock one of these pines over on me or uh, you know, if I get hurt some other way, knock it down in front of the road so I can't get out to the hospital that's 100 miles away. So, I understand, uh, based on experiences like I'm having this week, why a thunder god would be a major force in the religion of a people close to nature. And, of course, not just the Norse with Thor, but many other cultures the world round have thunder gods or gods with thunder as part of their, uh, their godly portfolio. Uh, one of my favorites is the, uh, well, I don't know if this is exactly a god, but uh, I think that it embodies a good, a good sense of what hummingbirds are really like. The Eastern Shoshone, uh, a name they have for the hummingbird is Domo Yagait which is the sound of the thunder. And uh, of course, in, in the beliefs of many Uto Aztecan speaking peoples, the hummingbird is a, a token of war and uh, that reflects uh, good observations of hummingbirds. But uh, anyway, me uh, opening up by bloviating about a, a fear of thunder and how a god of thunder might uh, be an important part of a culture close to nature may seem to be at odds with a point that I've made pretty often and made even vociferously pretty recently, which is that Thor doesn't have that much to do with thunder. But we have to draw a distinction that I'm often at pains to make and that I think it's, it's I, I don't know, maybe because I, I have um, all the persuasive abilities of a box turtle, I seem to, to have a lot of trouble getting across which is that in our written sources for Norse mythology, what we can really call actually preserved Norse mythology, right? The book's called Edda, the Poetic Edda, and the Prose Edda, written down in the 1200s in Iceland. Thor has almost nothing to do with thunder in terms of what he does, right? He shows up um, with thunder one time when he fights Rungnir uh, in a story told in Skaldskapar Mall in the Prose Edda. His name means thunder. Um, his hammer's name probably means lightning, as, as I've discussed here and there, and I'll discuss quite a bit in this video, actually. But by the time of, say, the late Viking Age that our poems in the Poetic Edda probably reflect uh, the traditions of, thunder has kind of been alienated out of his, his duties, his responsibilities, his actions. He's kind of only residually a thunder god and he's much more a personality, a, a very well-rounded character really that, that you can get a sense of what it's like to sit down across the table from, but not a sense of like what specific, you know, lightning bolt and thunderclap powers he has. Now, that does not mean that earlier on he or, or the conception preceding him and the pantheons of, of Germanic and Indo-European speaking peoples was not a thunder god. I think that quite likely he was, and one of the best lines of evidence for that is the linguistic connection between what's probably one of his names and the name of uh, thunder or thunder-related gods in other Indo-European languages. So with that horrifically long-winded introduction, let me talk about uh, Thor's origins in a thunder god, very likely, and how he's connected to thunder gods elsewhere in Indo-European.
And of course, before I continue any further, let me say how delighted I am that I have a hermit thrush singing along in this video. That's, uh, I don't think I've ever had a hermit thrush singing in a video. And there's, I think actually two pretty close to me right now. One of the most beautiful bird songs in the world. Uh, a real treat to have that, uh, I hope, coming across the microphone. All right, so I mentioned that one of Thor's names, or probably one of Thor's names, makes a connection to thunder gods elsewhere in Indo-European likely. What is that name? Well, it is Fjörgen with two N's. Now, Thor's mother is Fjörgen with one N. Um, but there is also a masculine Fjörgen with two N's deity who is very, very barely hinted at. Let's first of all mention uh, his mom, Fjorgen, uh, because of course she's a little bit better attested. In Horvath's The Oath, Sands of 56, uh, at the very end where Odin has insulted Thor and now they're pretty much done with each other and Thor is about to, to leave and he's asked for directions, part of what Odin says to him is, Haltu svo til vinstra vegsins, uns thu hittir verland. Thar mun fjörgun hitta Thor sonsin. So, hold to the left road, the road to the left, until you get to the land of men. There, Fjörgen will meet her son, Thor. Now, elsewhere, his mother is called simply Jor, the Earth, um, but they're clearly names for the same person, and by the time of, again, the, the kind of late Viking Age language that's attested in so much of the Poetic Edda, we have Fjorgen as another term for uh, the Earth. So in uh, Aldrun Grotter in the Poetic Edda, stanza 15, Borgny uh, says to Aldrun, Ekfilgvak ther o Fjorgenu, I followed you on the Earth. Fjorgen just used to mean Earth. We have an anonymous skald who calls uh, the sea Ols Fjorgenjar. The, of the earth of the eel, so the, the, earth's, the earth of the eel is, is the sea, it's where eels dwell. But other than, um, I think the only two places, at least in the Poetic Edda, where Thor is called the son of Fjorgen, is that one stands in Horvath's the Oath, and then in Volospan, stands of 54, he's called Fjorgen Yarbur right before he dies. Now, the masculine version of this name, Fjorgen with two ends is attested only once, and it's in a really weird context. And Lokasena, where Loki's insulting all the gods, stands at 26, and he says, Thegi thu frig, thu ert Fjorgens mar. Silent frig, you are Fjorgen's girl. Now, if this were the feminine name, the name of Thor's mom, the genitive, the possessive form would be Fjorgenjar. So we're not talking about her. Fjorgens is a genitive or possessive form of a masculine name, and that would be Fjorgen with two N's. We never hear about who this is, but it seems extremely likely that it is an old name of Thor. Now, what does it mean to call Frigg Thor's girl? It is not impossible, given how Norse myth, as we have it preserved in the Eddas, represents you know, again, probably late Viking Age traditions in Iceland, for the most part, and, and, and a heavy dose of Norway, which is, of course, where most of the Icelanders came from. It is not impossible that there were traditions in some places, sometimes, where Thor was Frigg's father. Uh, that is usually what it means to call someone, uh, some man's mare, to say that he's uh, her dad. It can mean girlfriend, but uh, that's less common and uh, uh, probably more difficult to explain than uh, Thor in some traditions being uh, her dad. I don't think that that's really the key issue here, though. Uh, whatever it means that Frigg is Fjorgen's girl, if that means that she's Thor's girl at all, the name Fjorgen has more of a connection to Thor than anyone else because, of course, the closest thing to it is the feminine name Fjorgen with one N being his mother. It also looks extremely like the names of thunder gods or thunder-related gods 
and other Indo-European languages. Let me give you a quick word from my friends and partners at Graham Frost. I'll come back and I'll look at uh, all these names and more. All right, so in Indo-European, we have a root, pair or perg, that means strike. All right, now, there is a word for the oak tree, which um, what I'm used to calling an oak is uh, definitely a scrubbier, lower thing uh, than what's usually meant in Europe. The, uh, the European trees designated oak. Uh, it's interesting how words for trees kind of wander the world and get assigned to uh, different kinds of trees, even by speakers of the same language. Uh, what's meant by oak in Europe is uh, one of the dominating trees in the forest and particularly susceptible, I'm not a science person, but from what I understand, uh, particularly susceptible to getting struck by lightning. So, curiously, there is a word for the oak tree that's pretty well tested that is formed from the struck one, right? Probably meaning struck by lightning. And um, this struck name is, uh, uh, begins perquu in uh, Proto-Indo-European. From it, we get, for example, Latin quercus, meaning oak. The, uh, the qua in Latin is actually what we would expect here. Um, we have the ancient name for uh, the forest in, that includes today's Black Forest, the uh, Hyrcanian Forest, that probably comes from something like Gaulish Erkinian Forest. We, we have reason to believe that Gaulish Erk means oak, and of course in the Celtic languages, peas are lost at the beginning of words, so that's exactly what we would expect. And given Grimm's Law, where peas become f's in Germanic languages, we see that we have a cognate in the Gothic word fergony, meaning mountain, probably originally a uh, woodland covered mountain like the ones I'm in right now, and it's Old English cognate uh, Fjörgen. Now, we have, all right, the, the, the struck word, but we also ha can probably reconstruct a Proto-Indo-European name for a god that means striker, and that would be Perkunos or Perkunos. Now, this, the, the specific derivational suffixes and uh, grammatical endings that are going to get applied to the common root name in different descendant languages are going to be different. But mutatis mutandis with a little bit of differences in, again, the, the, um, the stems, we get from that Germanic, specifically Old Norse names like Fjorgen, Fjorgen, Lithuanian Perkunas, Thunder God, Latvian uh, Perkuons, Thunder God, Old Prussian Perkunos, Thunder God, Old Slavic Perun, Perun, Thunder God, uh, and modern day words like Polish Piorun, uh, Czech Perun meaning lightning bolt, and Sanskrit Perjanya in the Vedas, a Thunder God. Uh, I think that in the, uh, the old Russian pronunciation is Pierun. I'm not great at uh, pronouncing Russian off the cuff, but I, I think that's right. So, these other deities who have names that look a lot like this name Fjorgen that we see in the Edda have portfolios that are very strongly inclusive of thunder. Uh, most distantly, we have in the Rig Veda 583, a hymn to Purjanya, the Indic uh, cognate of this root. We see... Um, I'm going to give you some of my translations that have been checked but are not the responsibility of uh, my good friend Kaylee Smith. In 2a we see, he breaks trees apart, he kills night creatures, all existence fears him, the carrier of the great weapon. Well, hell, if you showed that to me in an Eddic or Skaldic poem in Old Norse, I would say they're talking about Thor, of course, right? Uh, he kills... Uh, these enemy supernatural beings, right, night creatures is how I'm translating Rakshasa, but not too different in conception from the Yultans, uh, negative supernatural creatures in, in um, 
Norse conception. He carries a great weapon. Uh, the breaking trees apart is probably related to the Thunderbolt associations, right? He's striking things like oak trees. Or uh, consider in 6C, uh, facing this way, go with that thunder, sprinkling waters for us as Father Ashura. So definitely a thunder associated being. Now, uh, Pargenia's portfolio gets kind of absorbed by the much greater Vedic god Indra, who becomes uh, more the, the thunderer on uh, the classic uh, conception of the Vedas. And uh, interestingly, um, his lightning bolt weapon, Indra's, is called the uh, Vajra, the uh, root of which name is shared by the verb for what Thor does with his hammer when he uh, touches his goat's bones to bring them back to life or when he touches Baldur's funeral pyre and the prose at him. And that is the verb vigya, which we usually translate something like bless or hallow. So that's kind of cool. And, and um, I'm very much indebted to an article by uh, Joseph Nodge. Um, excuse me. I know Joseph Nodge. He's the Celtic professor at UCLA. His brother, uh, Gregory Nodge, who is at uh, Harvard, I think. Anyway, there's a great article by him in his book, Greek Mythology and Poetics. So you wouldn't know to look for it there uh, unless you were, uh, you know, the kind of person who would dig around for this kind of stuff. But he's got a great section on all of these cognates with these, these words associated with, with Thor and, and cognate God. So I'll show you the uh, reference of that at the bottom of the screen. For all you know, the way that I'm rambling today, maybe uh, you could read that in shorter time. But uh, I'm not just ripping off his article. You can get a whole lot more out of his article and you don't have to deal with my ramblings and conclusions. Now we also have uh, Pirun, the old Slavic god, strongly associated with thunder. His enemy, Veles, is a snake and a shape changer. Sounds a lot like Loki. Um, indeed, Loki slash his son, Jormungandr, the, the Mythgar serpent. And Pirun's weapon is a mace. So not exactly a hammer like Thor, uh, although there seems to be actually some variation within Scandinavia and the Baltic and Slavic countries of exactly what uh, unbladed weapon uh, the Thor, or the Thunder God, uses. It can be represented as something that looks more like an axe, including in Scandinavia. Now, uh, Boris uh, Rybakov, again, not great at saying Russian names I haven't heard before, uh, not an unimpeachable source, uh, but interestingly wrote of oaks in Eastern Europe clearly used for religious purposes, decorated with boar's jaws, or teeth. One of these is displayed at the uh, History Museum in Kew. Um, I wanted to point this out because there's clearly some old associations with boars for Thor that have been forgotten. The most interesting piece of evidence for that is that, uh, as Anatoly Lieberman has argued, I think persuasively, Th Thor's name Hloridi, which occurs pretty often because it alliterates with the word Hamar, so it's going to come up in poetry when you want to talk about Thor and mission his hammer and get a name for him that alliterates with it. Um, that name Hlorothy probably means pig writer. And even though Thor is not very associated with pigs in the Eddas, it suggests that he had some previous strong association with pigs that uh, maybe goes back to uh, Indo-European times based on the boar's jaws and teeth that come up in these um, oak shrines that seem to be associated with Pyrrhun. Uh, Byzantine Emperor Constantine the Seventh Porphyrogenitus in the first half of the 900s described an oak tree on an island where the Rus, of course the people with both Slavic and Norse roots, uh, would make sacrifices of birds, uh, bread, uh, meat, maybe people. I don't remember if he specifically wrote about human sacrifices, but there are records of human sacrifices by the Rus, of course. Uh, there's also an interesting charter from 1302 by a Galician Western Ukrainian in today's context, uh, named Leu uh, Danilovich, who uses Pyarun's oak as a known boundary spot. So implying that even though, of course, this would have been Christian times in that part of the world, uh, they were still an oak that was associated enough with Pyarun for the tree to be associated with his name. And uh, very interestingly, in Northern Russia, at Pyrin, there is uh, 
a great monastery from uh, slightly later times, but also a pagan shrine that has been found that was abandoned in the late 900s. There, great fires of oak, eight of them, were made in a circle around a central idol. And interestingly, the Hustin Chronicle of 1600s Ukraine also mentions an eternal fire of oak wood at Perun's, Perun's shrine. Note that uh, one of those eight fires, the one to the east around the idol at Pyrin, uh, looked like it might have been kept burning uh, eternally, right? Like the JFK fire. So that's uh, an interesting connection to make. Now, a little bit closer to Scandinavia and the Baltic, the Lithuanian Perkunas, uh, Latvian Perkuons, like the Slavic god, is mostly known uh, from projecting backwards from folklore known from more recent times, right? From like 19th century folklore. But to the extent that we can get uh, much of a picture of this pre Christian God, we see him strongly associated with thunder and the oak. Like the Slavic God, his rival is, uh, well, his, name, his rival is a very similar name, Vilnius or Vilnius, and he is a shape changer. Most notably, and I think this is the real kicker, he hurls a mace named Lightning, and we have this little snatch from a Latvian song that Nodge quotes, Perkuons met savu milnu. Perkuons throws his hammer. Milnu, which is uh, the name for the hammer, it's not the normal, normal word for hammer and mace, it's not the normal word for lightning, but it is cognate with Mjolnir. It's from the very same word in Indo-European, just like uh, undoubtedly uh, Russian Molnia or uh, Welsh Melt. And there's a few other words in other Indo-European languages that I can't recall off the top of my head uh, that come from the very same word for lightning. Um, still the normal word for lightning in a Russian or Welsh connection, not in Latvian or Norse, but in Latvian and Old Norse alike, it becomes the name of the weapon of the god associated now or associated previously with thunder. And to me, that's really just the thunderbolt bit of information there. Um, I actually hadn't known about that till very recently, till reading Nudge article, and I was just stunned by that little, little fact. Uh, I'm not sure that that name for the uh, hammer or mace is attested more than that one time, but it's still just you know, proverbially dropping a, a hammer, as it were. Now, the name Thor also uh, does have, of course, a Proto-Indo-European uh, heritage. I've discussed in another recent video how it's the word for thunder. In fact, it is the exact same word that becomes thunder in English. Um, it may well have been used as a name for this same god in Indo-European times. We see a Celtic god named Taranis, which has a name directly from the same word for, for thunder or Thor. Uh, it just has metathesis. It would be from something like Tanaros, Tanaros, uh, Tanaros. I'm not quite sure what the accent would be in Proto-European on that word. Now, we don't know much about this god, but he's, you know, Celt with Celtic, we're in much the same position as we often are with Baltic and Slavic. Sometimes, you know, we know some names, we know some later folklore that kind of points back at pre-Christian times, but uh, not always all that much. But we still have, uh, in the modern Celtic languages, words for thunder from the same uh, name. So Welsh, Taran, and Irish, Torniach, I believe so that would be pronounced, Torniach. Any Irish speakers want to make fun of me, uh, feel free. But I think that's pretty cool that in Welsh, thunder and lightning, Taran and Melt, are the exact same words in an Indo-European context as Thor and Mjolnir, right? Pretty cool, even though, of course, uh, Thor and Mjolnir weren't part of the Welsh pre-Christian pantheon. It really attests to how interconnected these languages and the cultures speaking them were, and that their, their myths once were. Now, again, the past has passed, um, a point that I make uh, over and over and over again, unpersuasively. Uh, remember that you can't go back to just one single original time, right? Uh, every generation that you go back, there's another generation before it. So I'm not arguing that uh, Perkunos or even, you know, Tanaros is Thor's 
true name, but probably the conception of Thor goes back to a god named Perquinos and or Taneros, the same way that in uh, the Norse text we have in the Eddas, he's called Thor and Hloridi and probably Fjorgen. Uh, many gods have many names. And uh, that this god had a strong association with thunder probably in Indo-European times is very well supported by the thunderous records of his descendants in Baltic, Slavic, Indic, Celtic at least, and certainly in Norse, but just remember that it's residually in Norse. It is possible that already in the Viking Age, he wasn't really remembered as a god of thunder primarily, but as a god of the common man, of, of your, you know, your Viking crew, Dranger, or your, uh, you know, your Dranger at the farm, your hardworking kind of everyman, which is really the, the character of Thor that we meet in the Eddas, uh, where he doesn't have that much to do with lightning or thunder, but like the thunder that he's named for, he carries an echo of lightning from an earlier time. All right, that's enough rambling from grizzly country and hermit thrush country for you today. I hope everyone out there is doing well, and uh, I thank my Patreon supporters for the support that continues to make these videos possible. Um, it is an incredible privilege to have your support and, and the ability to pay my bills with it. And uh, to everyone out there from high up in beautiful Wyoming, let me wish you all the best.